Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Amy Robertson. I'm the science coordinator for this partnership. And today, uh, Dr. Terry Griffith is going to be talking to us about climate and desert amphibian physiology, a resource for planning adaptation strategies. This webinar is part of a series related to um, one of our central themes for the Desert LCC. We have developed critical management questions, and we have a series of six questions. Um, this one is for critical management question number four, which is focused on uh, the physiological impacts of climate change on species and eventually developing potential adaptation strategies. So I'm going to hand things over to John Arnett, who is one of the members of the team uh, that's acting as an applied science think tank looking at critical management question number four. And he's going to introduce today's presenter. So please go ahead, John. Sure. Uh, thanks, Amy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for participating in today's CNQ4 webinar. I'm John Arnett, a wildlife biologist with Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix, Arizona. And as Amy said, I'm on the uh, CNQ4 team. And it's my genuine pleasure today to introduce our webinar speaker, Dr. Kerry Griffith-Kyle, and professor in the Department of Natural Resources Management at Texas Tech University, uh, because Kerry and I were both tadpoles, uh, otherwise known as undergraduate students, uh, together years ago at the University of Florida. Uh, later, as early stage metamorphs, we worked together for a summer running pitfall traps and herbarays. Um, most significant result of our work that summer was that we did not cannibalize each other. Um, so Dr. Griffith Kyle has earned her bachelor's in wildlife ecology and conservation at the University of Florida, her master's in forestry at Northern Arizona University, PhD in biology at Syracuse, and did a postdoc at New Mexico State University. Uh, Carrie's work examines how stressors, including climate, affect biodiversity associated with ephemeral water in arid and semi-arid regions. Uh, in fact, some of Carrie's recent work was for my organization at the Barry Goldwater Range in Southwest Arizona, where Carrie and her team related amphibian and ordinate biodiversity at isolated water sites to the physical and chemical of those waters and the landscape connectivity between isolated waters. Standing on that project, uh, soon she will begin work on modeling the functional connectivity of surface waters in or in desert for T and E species, game species, and basin and others. So because of her background and current research interests, we thought Carrie would be a, a good inclusion in the CMQ4 webinar series. So without further ado, let's resorb our tales and begin today's webinar entitled Climate and Desert Amphibian Physiology, a resource for planning adaptation strategies by Kerry Kyle. So, Kerry, you may emerge from the water. <laughs> Thank you, John, for that very creative introduction. I really appreciate it. I also appreciate the opportunity to present this webinar. Again, I'm Kerry Griffiths Kyle, and I've been working in desert systems on amphibians and other critters for the past nine years. I designed this webinar to try and address some of the questions that people from the working group had expressed so that you have um, insight into amphibian physiology, but you also have some suggestions for uh, climate adaptation strategies. During this present presentation, I'm starting out going over CMQ4's basic questions. Then I'll go into amphibian vulnerability and then quickly into projected climate for the desert southwest. And I'll talk about physiological responses to climate change and what those potential impacts are. When we get to potential impacts, you'll see red text boxes on the screen, and those have some of the, the research questions that I think are important and may need to be addressed. From there, we'll go into management and climate adaptation, and then I have one additional caution at the end. You'll notice up at the top of the slides it says overview, so you will know where you are throughout the presentation by looking up at the top. 
So first, a quick uh, glance at CMQ4's questions. I want to know which species and to what extent they'll be impacted by climate change. So we're focused on amphibians during this webinar. We're also interested in climate adaptation strategies, so I've put together some of those strategies towards the end of the webinar. Let's go into amphibian vulnerability. <clears throat> Amphibians as a general tax are in trouble with 43% of the species declining and 32.5% of the species threatened. Um, we're losing populations in the U.S., and this is based on long-term occupancy estimates. Um, these estimates include detection probability in them. <coughs> in the U.S. is going down by 3.7% uh, with populations that are the most in trouble declining the fastest. On top of that, for the vast majority of these species, we don't know the extent of their ability to respond to climate change. We don't know the ability of individuals to actually acclimate to different temperatures. And we don't know the genetic variation in populations, so the things that natural selection can work on to create adaptation. Amphibians are ectotherms, which means they're relatively the same temperature as the environment. Um, this means that you have increased temperature, you could have some problems. Um, they also have skin that they use for respiration, but this means they desiccate faster. Um, and they're vulnerable to changes in water availability. They have a complex life cycle, so as managers, we not only need to consider the small um, aquatic habitats, we need to consider the terrestrial areas as well. And especially for the, the species that have aquatic tadpoles, which are, are most of the ones we're dealing with, um, they're expected to be more at risk because they're using ephemeral aquatic systems for breeding, and these, these systems are really sensitive to changes in uh, temperature and rainfall. Now within amphibians, uh, you've got different species, and different species have different traits that make them more or less vulnerable. So some of the life history traits that you should be paying attention to are for vulnerability, those species that have low survival as um, later life history stages, so when they get towards adults, or those that reach reproductive maturity later on, or they have small clutch sizes. Basically, this is anything that limits the amount of young that an individual will produce over their lifetime. Also, species with restricted geographic ranges tend to be adapted to specific environmental conditions. So there's less genetic variation there and less opportunity for adaptation to new conditions. Then lastly, um, those species that are living close to their optimal performance temperatures already or those that have a, a narrow performance breadth um, tend to be more vulnerable. And if you aren't quite sure what I'm talking about with that now, when we get to thermal response curves, we'll go through this, and I'll show you what I actually mean by that. Okay, so projected climate for the southwest. Well, it's hot and it's getting hotter, and the climate models are in agreement for this. Um, what you're seeing here is a screenshot from the NEX DCP30 viewer from the USGS. Um, this can get uh, county-level downscale data, and this is based on statistical downscaling of the CMIP-5 models uh, for temperature and precipitation by NASA. And CMIP-5 are the, the most current uh, global models. Here I've got the link, so if uh, you'll be able to use it if you want to. Um, you can put the time period in here. I've got the mean model, they use 30 models in this, and the maximum temperature for Arizona. And what we can see down here is the, what the temperature change is. And we're expecting probably between a four and six degree increase in max temperature for September, comparing 1980 through 2004 to 2050 through 2074. Down here, you have a histogram showing model output, so you can see how the models are distributed. And then over here, you can see the max temperature throughout the year over 
um, what's currently throughout the year for max temperature. So this is a really nice resource um, that's fairly new. Uh, I just got the announcement before Christmas on this. Water availability is also going down. This is not just precipitation. This takes into account evaporation as well. Um, and Seeger et al. 2007 uh, did an analysis where he averaged 19 climate models um, and looked at the, the mean precipitation. And so the red line is the mean precipitation, and the pink is the uh, 25th and 75th percentile. But basically what's going on here is over time, there's less water available, available to use. Now I've got these citations throughout the, the presentation. There is a slide at the end that has um, the, uh, the literature cited on it in case you want to get to any of these publications. So let's talk about some potential physiological responses. Um, like uh, Dr. Blair Wolf showed us in the webinar on bird response to climate, different species and groups of species vary in their thermal sensitivity. This is going to be the same for amphibians as well. Um, so first what I want to do is take you back to the mechanism. So this is going to be the same whether you're talking about birds or amphibians or mammals or so forth. It's just uh, going to be a little bit larger in ectotherms. So temperature impacts on phys physiology. Um, temperature constrains chemical reactions, and all life proceeds because of these, these chemical reactions. So as you increase temperature, you increase biological activity. That means you need to breathe more, you need to eat more, you produce more waste, and so forth. Um, but if it gets too hot, proteins like enzymes start to come apart and denature because they're held together with weak ionic bonds and those high temperatures can those bonds and the proteins don't function anymore. So you lose some uh, efficiencies in biological activity. Now the general idea is this starts to happen around 40 degrees C. Um, this is it's species specific and it's protein specific. So some uh, can go to higher temperatures, but that's just around the temperature where this starts to happen. Cell membranes also have some issues. The, the phospholipid bilayer, which as you remember back to basic biology is this part in here, um, fuses at high temperatures. So things aren't getting in and out, which means you slow or stop uh, biochemical reactions and desynchronized biological functions because nothing's moving. And the last way is oxygen limitation. And this idea is that as we get to higher and higher temperatures, the aerobic respiration, so what they take in um, through lungs or through their skin, isn't enough to actually meet the needs of the mitochondria. These are the basic mechanisms. Now, some of the patterns we see for amphibians, um, you see thermal tolerance low in young embryos and older tadpoles. Um, so these are the most susceptible, uh, as far as we know right now, life history stages. And for desert amphibians that breed when you have these big rainfalls, the embryos probably, it's not going to be as big of a deal because of the rainfall, the temperatures have gone down, and, and they get through that egg stage fairly quickly. It's going to be the later life history stages, so the, the tadpoles as they're getting ready to go through metamorphosis, that will be more constrained here. Um, and this also is more important for species that take longer to go through metamorphosis or to get to it and go through. So toads may be more susceptible as compared to, say, spadefoots, which get through faster. Um, another thing to consider here is when you're looking at the literature, most studies in the lab work with, say, tadpoles at Gosner stage 25, which is after they hatch and after they start eating. So it's not in either of these stages that are most susceptible. So when you're looking for temperature sensitivity, pay attention to when um, when people have done the studies. 
Okay, aquatic embryos tend to be more temperature tolerant than terrestrial embryos. Um, and those species with restricted ranges tend to have narrow thermal limits because they're more specialized. And they end up generally having less <coughs> genetic diversity as well. I also went through trying to find a consensus on how latitude and elevation affect you know, thermal tolerance. And I found papers that said, hey, look, we found that thermal tolerance increases with latitude. And I also found papers saying that it decreased with latitude. So right now, we don't have a general consensus here. Probably things are much more complicated than a, a simple latitudinal or elevational gradient. Measure thermal stress several different ways. Um, one way we can do this is looking at corticosterones and heat shock proteins. Um, these are adaptations to environmental stress, and they're actually very important, especially in desert amphibians, because they help them respond to declining hydro periods. So um, they're, they're important, but they can be used to look at, say, in the lab, um, how stressed are the amphibians under the different temperatures. And this can also be used in the field. For example, this paper found that uh, salamanders from their hottest site ended up having higher heat shock proteins. This is one way to measure. Another way um, to look at the impacts are looking at thermal performance curves. And this is evaluating species sensitivity. So this is, if you look down at the body, bottom, this is body temperature. So if you're talking about tadpoles, this is really easy because it's the, the same temperature as the water they're in. Look over here on the x-axis, you have performance. And that can be anything like locomotion, feeding, metabolism. I've got a whole list here on the side. If you go up here, we have the maximum performance, Pmax, that occurs at the asymptote at the optimal temperature, T opt. The width of the curve is the performance stress. So that is, those are the temperatures over which that species or that individual can function. Now you have the critical thermal minima and the critical thermal maxima. So above and below those temperatures, the individual just doesn't function anymore and um, that can lead to death. And so this is a really nice way of looking at for individuals and then for a species or a population how can they deal with the different temperatures? Another physiological impact of climate change um, is through reductions in body size. Um, there's a paper that I have up here from Sheridan and Bickford in 2011, and they go into a very detailed explanation of the, the mechanisms for this. But this has been found in ectotherms, like amphibians, but also in birds and mammals as well. And it's caused by a number of mechanisms. Um, some of the ones I picked out were increased metabolism. If you remember, temperature increases chemical reactions, and so you've got that increased metabolism. There's water limitation. There's nutrient limitation. These are pictures from David Bickford. Um, uh, you have male frog on the left from the 1980s versus male frog from 2008. And these are about average sizes. And this might seem like not that big of a deal, but in amphibians, body size has a very large impact on fitness. So if you have smaller individuals, especially at metamorphosis, um, you end up having lower reproduction, uh, they don't live as long, and so forth. So if you have fewer opportunities to reproduce and you cut down on the number of offspring that are produced each of those times and the number of years that an individual lives, this can have a large impact on population persistence. And so this could be a very important component um, that, of climate change. Also expecting rain shifts um, uh, due to changes in environmental conditions. And we expect those shifts to mirror their physiological tolerances. Um, we can look at this 
using uh, climate envelope mapping, which is relatively, relatively in quotes, easy to do with existing data um, because we have locations where we found the species. But this is a physiological black box. This basically looks at, okay, the amphibians are here right now and the climatic conditions are this. In the future, the climate conditions are going to shift here and this is where we expect the amphibians to move. It doesn't include things like species interactions or other things that might be constraining those uh, populations. Um, the, the map here is output from one of the climate envelope models from Ficatola et al. 2007 looking at uh, habitat suitability for bullfrogs. So we can do the, the climate envelope mapping fairly easily, but it's, it's that physiological black box. We can also look at functional niche and look at that in comparison to climate projections to actually get a mechanistic view of, okay, where are they going to be? And this is going back and looking at that thermal response curve, and that's what you're seeing down on the bottom. Um, this takes detailed species-specific information. So if you are targeting species, you probably want to look at the most vulnerable or the most in trouble. Okay, so those were the physiological impacts. Um, or the physiological responses, and now let's move on to impact. And remember, in this section, I'm going to include questions. The first impact is as temperature grows, goes up, dissolved oxygen goes down. This is a simple physical relationship. It just has to do with kinetic energy. So the molecules speed up and they don't stay in aqueous solution anymore. Okay, well, tadpoles can go up there. So shouldn't be a problem, although there's a metabolic cost to gulping air. And we don't know if the competition for oxygen would be enough to um, have some sort of cost on uh, tadpoles, some measurable cost. Now for adults, they generally come out to breed at night when it's raining hard enough or you have the thunder and, and all of that. Um, and they may stay out. Uh, longer if you've got relatively humid days. Now, so for most of the year, their refuge is, is underground, they're fossorial. Um, they might be using terrestrial refuges as well when they're up top. We don't know. Also don't know how tolerant they are of expected temperatures. Um, we don't know if they need the surface refuges or if they do what are suitable refuges. Um, and we don't know if current refuges are adequate. Basically, we don't know a whole lot about the adults other than when and where they show up for breeding. Um, this, our opportunities for looking at this have been changing. There are, uh, we can use radio telemetry on the larger species and get about two weeks of data on how they're using the environment. But it's still, it's really hard to track an adult amphibian in the desert, especially in rocky areas. So embryos and larvae, how do they respond to temperature and water availability? Well, we'll come back to hydroperiods in a little bit and focus on the, the temperature and how much water is there. So if you have deep pools, um, there should be some thermal refuge. Basically, they can go down to the bottom and they aren't exposed to as high a temperatures. But in very shallow pools, they aren't buffered. Um, and we, in uh, work we did during 2012 in the Sonoran Desert, found temperatures up to 50 degrees C, which is really hot. So basic questions, how hot will the pools get? Um, how deep? do they need to be to provide thermal refuge? How tolerant are these tadpoles of these temperatures? And this is actually two different questions. This is, okay, how plastic are they or what can they acclimate to versus um, do they have the potential or the variation in the population already to adapt to the new climate conditions? So those are two separate questions. 
And then, you know, basic, simple on-the-ground work, how do variations in the natal pools contribute to amphibian production and population persistence? Now, we know water availability is going down. Um, uh, rainfall patterns are changing. Uh, temperatures increasing. We've got more evaporation. Um, what we've got here are um, models that Jeff Kovach and I did looking at changes in average temperature versus changes in evaporation. So this is if uh, the temperature went up 2 degrees C, 4 degrees C, and so forth. At the time, these were the projections from the average model for temperature, and this is what we expect for a change in evaporation. Okay, that's, that's all fine and dandy, and the, the equations used for that are vetic. We use relative humidity, wind speed, and so forth that, that we got from on the ground work. Now over here, we have time to drying versus pool volume. And this is in kiloliters. So at two kiloliters, which we actually had a pool um, that we followed, we would expect based on that uh, to dry in about 24 and a half days. What we found is it dried in less than half that time that we're missing here is wildlife consumption because these are solid, this is a solid bedrock bottom pool. So how much is wildlife consuming and is this expected to increase? Well, it's probably going to increase, but how much is it consuming? Um, how much will this shorten the hydro period beyond what we'd expect based on basic physics? And what resources will managers need to allocate to maintain these waters? Because Already, you're in the process of making sure water is available, um, and it's expensive. So what are you going to have to put in for it? We are, my lab right now is collecting this data. So we're getting wildlife numbers and numbers of visits. And so eventually, you'll see a, uh, a proposal from us looking to try and quantify this and model this under future conditions. Now we've got Evidence for declines because of, of water availability. Think um, springs. As they dry up, there's just not an opportunity to breathe. Or if you have a shortened hydro period, you aren't necessarily going to have anything getting out of that pool. You'll have desiccated tadpoles. But it goes beyond that. We've um, had declines in species richness and abundance in areas where they have uh, larger seasonal fluctuations in temperature and precipitation than they did historically. We've also documented it, this in areas with reduced humidity. We found in some areas populations going down and in higher instances of finding um, little toadlets or po post metamorphs um, desiccated. So, how will these things impact population persistence and dynamics? Um, in these desert amphibians. Now, a step back and looking at some of these interactions, we know that increasing temperature is going to decrease hydro period. We've got more evaporation. We know, based on physics, that dissolved oxygen is going, going down. And we also know biological activity is going up because of the increase in chemical reactions. Increase in biological activity means increased dissolved oxygen use, increased food resources needed. That means increased competition. You also have increased waste production. Now, if you put this with hydro period, you have a concentration of those wastes. You also have a concentration of other organic and inorganic molecules. This leads to stress. What are the impacts of each of these stressors? Can we model these interactions? to quantify what we're expecting um, in terms of populations. Showing uh, specific information on this, this is from um, work we did in 2012 on the barium gold water east. Um, we have ammonia. Um, we measured um, nitrogen um, and ammonia specifically in Tanahas, which are these rock type pools, and the man-made catchments. Now, ammonia's, ammonia in Tanahas was generally less than one milligram per liter. Um, this is background rate, what we expect. Ammonia in the catchments was um, fairly high, 
in 76% of the cases, it was above 11 milligrams per liter. This is really uh, concerning for amphibians. This is well above the US EPA's freshwater guidelines for aquatic life. And the reason there are two red lines here are because the, the toxicity of ammonia has to do with pH. And so this, these were pH variations. Um, and these are well above what are going to impact amphibians. So questions here, um, during drought, do we see these elevated ammonia levels in stagnant waters? Well, the reason we think we're getting this is because rainfall in the, the natural Tanahas flushes the debris out. Um, in the catchments, we've done a very, very good job of trying to capture as much water and hold it and not let it evaporate. So any of the organic matter in the trough ends up staying there and accumulating, and which is how you get the, the ammonia buildup. So if you have large Tanahas that are in drought periods, um, do we see this ammonia? Um, how extensive is the ammonia problem across the desert region? Uh, we put in a proposal for this last year to the desert LCC, but this isn't a priority right now. Um, what impact does the water quality have on amphibian production? And what other water quality parameters will change with, with climate change? So climate is also going to impact amphibian phenology. Um, this is the seasonal patterns of their life cycle. Um, and most of the literature on this has to do with more mesic sites where you see amphibians breeding earlier and earlier in the year. Now, our amphibians generally come out in response to heavy rainfall or thunder. That's where we get the breeding. But we're having changing patterns in rainfall, and we'll end up with more in the winter. Um, how plastic are amphibians in timing of reproduction, and does this vary by species, which it probably does. We know some of them can come out as early as, say, March. Some of them can go as late as September. But we don't know how far that can stretch. Um, we also don't know if it can stretch further. Do we have a problem with other resources that they need when they're tadpoles? Um, and if this happens, is it going to impact amphibian fitness? Hmm. Now for rain shifts, we've got here output from uh, Wright et al. 2013. Amber Wright just gave a webinar for another critical management question, and she presented this information. Uh, they did a really nice project on uh, California herps looking at Maxent models. And so what over here is um, where they're expecting to find the long-toed salamander. And so this is model consensus means that 11 models agreed that this was going to be habitat. No models agreed that this was going to be habitat. So basically, they're not going to be here. And they've done this in conjunction with an extrapolation map. And this simply means that where it's green, is where you're finding them now. Where it's darker green, you're finding more of them. And where it's pink, you're not, find, or you're not finding them now. So this is an extrapolation. Now if you notice, you might normally think, OK, rain shifts, they're going to shift north. But that's not always the case, which is why it's important to look at some of that climate envelope modeling. You can get them responding to things like water availability, rainfall, and so forth and get counterintuitive patterns. So this ends up being an important tool. So what are the expected rain shifts for desert species? Um, and are we expecting any new ones to arrive, which um, I think so, but it's worth taking a look at. For species that we expect to be the most vulnerable or sensitive, it would probably be, probably be worth investing in looking at the functional niche. So looking at uh, tolerance response curves to see how well they'll handle different conditions. This can help us define our management options. Um, what can we actually do to make things better? So through this, I've been talking about stress in amphibians. 
um, increasing temperature, decreasing hydro period, changing rainfall patterns, and so on and so forth. And this leads to stress. Um, times in, or decreases in development, decreases in growth, overall size differences, um, suppressed immune function, lower reproductive output, and so forth. These are general patterns. <clears throat> But what are the implications of these for species persistence? So we know many of these patterns from, from other systems as well. Um, so we don't know to what extent things are, are going to um, impact, say, development and growth and so forth. And having that information um, would be extremely helpful in modeling population persistence, which is what you really are interested in. Can they hang around? Are they going to persist here? That we're going to get into management and climate adaptation strategies. My first suggestion is a, a, a strong suggestion here, um, plan at the landscape scale. This is really important because you're dealing with species that in general focus on uh, ephemeral, isolated waters that are very patchy, they're stochastic, which means you don't know when they're going to fill or when they're not going to be filled. An example of this on the left is a climate re or is a uh, landscape resistance map. This is a, a, a simple GIS analysis where you're looking at how likely is an amphibian to be moving through the landscape. Um, the outline is in white is uh, BMGR East. The red dots are catchments, the blue dots are other types of waters. And the kind of blue shading is area where we expect them to be able to move through easily. Red, not so much, and then the lines are least cost path. So this is, this is a simple model that um, you can probably do now. The problem with GIS models like this is they crash when you start putting in lots of nodes. And in this case, the nodes would be those water sites. When you get above about 1,500, you're going to have some problems. So we were just funded, Nancy McIntyre and I were just funded to do a network analysis. And this is actually using the same tools that are used in uh, analyzing social networks. But looking at how uh, the the sites function on a landscape um, in terms of connectivity. So over here on the right, you see this is actually the same map as on the left. So here's the point here, here. And what you can do is look at clusters um, and look at how these things are connected. Sometimes you want them connected, sometimes you don't. It depends on the species you're dealing with. But this only deals with the structural connectivity. You need on-the-ground information about habitat quality to go with this, to do a good job at planning. Also need to identify vulnerable species. You are very interested in this question. Um, one of ways to do this is a simple phylogenetic analysis. What sorts of traits? are you expecting to be an issue um, for, for the species? You can also do qualitative rankings. NatureServe has a climate change vulnerability index. The Forest Service has SAVES, a system for assessing vulnerability of species to climate change. I put both of the, the links in the presentation, so if you want to look at them, you can get to them. Um, and then do the, the climate envelope map, mapping. Um, what are you expecting? How big are the ranges and so forth? And then for those species that you just you don't have enough information or you're most worried about really, um, look at comparative thermal response work um, and go through so you have detailed information on what sorts of management actions are going to uh, be most cost effective in helping increase uh, population persistence. Then there are things like breeding site enhancement and restoration. Uh, Shu et al. in 2011 did a nice paper 
I'm looking at, at some of the strategies, and I have them cited on some of the strategies that they suggested. For example, you can increase hydro period in a Tanaha um, by adding some cement, or you can increase hydro period by digging out a spring or, or a wetland area. Extend that hydro period. You can also extend the hydro period with solar pumps or windmills or trucking or um, using a helicopter to bring water in. The thing with any of these um, enhancements or creation of new water is that you want that site to mimic the natural waters that they would use. You, you want that, and you want them to actually use it and to queue in to use it. A caution here, which most of you are probably already thinking about, is that you don't want to extend the hydro period to where it's permanent or semi-permanent if that's not what was there, because you can end up having invasions from bullfrogs, from crayfish, from um, other fish that uh, basically view amphibian eggs and tadpoles as cancer. Not what we're looking for. Another adaptation strategy that Shu et al. highlighted were thermal and hydrologic refuges. Um, I'm not sure how important these will be in the desert system because we've, we really haven't looked at this. Um, uh, for example, if you have a, a species that is a terrestrial breeder and it's endangered so you need to do something very, um, very quickly, you can directly add water to change humidity. And increasing humidity can increase the number of eggs or the number of offspring. And so this picture on your left is from Australia, where they've done that for um, a toad down there. Um, you can also provide structural refuge. Here's a rock pile, just because we really don't know if these are needed. We don't know if we need to add them if we're putting in new waters. But it may be worth considering. Uh, so our relocation, reintroduction, translocation, and head starting projects. Uh, these are things that you're doing now. Um, they're currently part of management for species like the Chiricahua leopard frogs and for Wyoming toads and other endangered species. Um, these things are expensive. Um, they're labor intensive. but Sometimes you have to do that. Now, Dee Dee Olson and um, Park are collecting data. Um, Dee Dee Olson's with the Forest Service. They're collecting data on these projects. And what they're hoping to do is put together a publication, basically a lessons learned type thing. So if you have information or updated information, they would love to get it. Um, they have not updated their database since 2011. Um, but the, the project is still ongoing. Okay, and we have one additional caution here um, that has to do with disease. Diseases are a huge part of amphibian decline. If you only focus on climate, you can still leave uh, the amphibians vulnerable. Um, you know, stress suppresses immune function already. So any disease out there is going to be more important. Now, this is a, a Maxent output. So uh, looking at BD, chytrid fungus, big bad for amphibian populations. And what you see here was current, probably using 2008 or 2009 data, is there were a couple instances where they found BD. If by now they found it in more places. The DOD park um, is just writing up a project where they found it in a number of places, and BMGR East found some on theirs as well. But if you look at the, the climate modeling, what you find is that, okay, yeah, it shouldn't be a problem, so maybe we shouldn't, shouldn't worry about it. Well, there's, a, there's an issue with this, and that's that BD should not be in the desert. We shouldn't have it there right now because its thermal limits, as published, are up to 27 degrees C. Um, they think, so Michael San Francisco, who's also here at Texas Tech, um, has evidence that they can form biofilms 
to protect themselves up to about 30 degrees C. But if you look at the temperature of the waters down here, in Sonoran Desert catchments in Sanajas, and, and I did the, um, I compared the two, and this was using eye button um, <coughs> on temperature. Um, their average temperature was 26 degrees C, so up towards that, that uh, critical thermal maxima. And the average maximum was 40 degrees C, and we had one get up to 50 degrees C. They, the BD should not be able to hang around here. So we've got some, um, some hypotheses for what might be going on here. Oh, wait a minute. Chihuahuan Desert Earthen Livestock Tanks. Um, the average temperature there was 26 degrees C. This was measured uh, during the morning, and so I don't have um, maxima, I don't have um, maximum values uh, once or twice a season. What might be going on in at least the Sonoran Desert is we're putting in catchments with large underground reservoirs, which could be buffering the temperature um, and keeping it where once you get BD in there, um, it has a nice place to hang out. It could also be that it's in the soil and in the burrows, and that's where the amphibians are getting inoculated. Um, this needs to be looked at. The information from the barium Goldwater yeast last year was that they only found the BD in the catchments. Um, but there were only, I believe, one Tanaha and five catchments. So this really needs to be looked at further. So in summary, um, what I am suggesting is plan at a landscape scale, but don't stop there because that just gives you the structure of the environment. You actually want to understand how that environment is functioning, so you need cross-scale information. You need to know something about habitat quality. It's a good idea to assess vulnerability, so using phylogenetic analysis, qualitative uh, indices and so forth, um, but also include disease in here. This is important because toads are actually much more susceptible to BD than frogs are because they don't have the same antimicrobial peptides in their skin. So it's more of an issue for them. Um, and then target the species and habitats most at risk. Um, this may mean doing detailed physiological studies, um, also looking at uh, population modeling so you get an idea of population persistence. And then when you're doing adaptation strategies, and the ones I suggested here are not, um, I'm sure you can come up with more. Um, so they aren't the, the end of that, but they should be tested because we haven't really tested these things uh, to any great extent before. So th that would be a really good idea. Literature cited if you're interested in any of the, the papers that were cited throughout this. That, I'd be happy to take questions. Gary, thank you so much uh, for this great webinar. There's a lot of, a lot of information there. So um, I want to put it out to our audience. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Gary? You might be on mute still. Be sure to take yourself off mute or uh, send me a note in the chat. I, I, I have a question. Um, this is Sally Heil from California, and I was just Please wondering if you have a, um, this, this is Sally from California, That's and I was just wondering thing. if you have guesses about thermal refuges and how deep those pools need to be. I mean, I know it depends probably on the ambient temperature and location, but did you have any guesses what would be deep versus shallow? Well, the the picture that you're looking at now, I definitely consider shallow. Um, <laughs> I don't. Um, and that's because we don't know how much the water is going to heat up. We don't know the tolerance of the tadpoles already. Um, and so 
if I gave you a guess right now, it it would be a complete guess instead of an educated suggestion. Right. And I'd rather not do that. Okay. Just wondered. But an easy an easy way to look at this is to take a couple of I buttons. Um, stick one in a plastic bag that you get all the air out of and maybe put a brick on it and put it at the bottom of your waters and one at the top of the waters to actually be able to look and see what your t temperature differential is. Okay, good. Thank you. Carrie, I have a question. Yes. How are you doing? This is Ruben Gay from the Lincoln National Forest here in uh, southern Ruben, how you New doing? Mexico. How are you doing? Pretty good. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering if, if you have done any work or anyone else in this region have used the Habitat Stamp program to fund any of these adaption strategies you just were discussing? Or um, are there any ways we can use the Habitat Stamp program to fund projects like these outside of, say, enclosures and uh, trick tanks? That's a really good question that I have no – uh, background in. So okay. that one would be for the agency folks at the, the maybe the Desert LCC. Um, Amy, would you by any chance know how to answer that? I don't. Um, does anyone else know about that program? No, I guess not. Okay. It might be worth contacting uh, the people who run that program. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna bring it. I'm gonna uh, bring it up, and then we have a meeting with the Citizens Advisor okay. Committee uh, coming up, and I think I'm gonna address address this to them. Okay. Good. Great. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, this is John Ernett. I, I have a question. Terry, um, I don't know if you can really answer this, but you know, you mentioned a couple times that we should plan at the landscape scale, but it also seems to me that, as, as you mentioned, that, you know, the, I don't know what I would call it, the microclimate or the micro conditions at each of these mm -hmm. sites is so important. So how do you, and you also said at the end to, to use cross-scale information. So how how would we really do that to be thinking about how the, the to link across the, the landscape scale all the way down to the, the micro scale of each of these little isolated waters? Well, I can give you an example. Um, the, the project that's just been funded um, by the Desert LCC, thank you very much, with Nancy McIntyre and I, we're looking at um, structural connectivity. So we're using that network analysis to figure out for different types of species how connected are the waters throughout the Sonoran Desert. We also know at least something rather critical about the, the waters, which is the ammonia. And we know that it can get very high in the catchments. Now, using this information, this is site-specific, it's found in the catchments, what we do in looking at the network is we wait the waters differently. So this is habitat, this is not habitat, this is um, not something that we really want. Um, and and what, what I mean when I say that is, so we had tadpoles breeding in catchments that hot, had high ammonia. Um, and why are they doing that? Why would they go there? Well, probably because the adaptation is to find anything that looks like water and go for it because that is the critical limiting resource. And those catchments were within four kilometers of a Tanaha. So they were providing basically an attraction to individuals. Now, if you don't have that sort of information in the overall landscape model, um, you're missing some very important pieces when you're talking about um, uh, managing for species. Thanks, Carrie. Any other questions? We probably have time for a couple more questions. Yeah, hey, this is Bruce Jones. Um, I'm wondering if you've tried out uh, CircuitScape to evaluate connectivity across landscapes. We're hoping to do that. Um, uh, we just are, so 
we've got this project started and we're um, convincing the graduate student that, that CircuitScape needs to be part of this analysis. Um, and that is our goal. We completely agree. That's a very useful and powerful tool. Yeah, because um, you know it it um, it doesn't seem to suffer from the same problem of having too many nodes. You can really load up a lot in there. So, and it also works well with the network analysis. So yeah, sure, sure does. Yeah, good. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? By the way, this is Bruce again. Say hi to Nancy when you see her. Okay, I will. <laughs> We we both uh, interact a lot through the uh, EALI landscape ecology community. Okay, hey, well, the, we're we're going to be presenting up there uh, in Anchorage this year, so. Very good. Uh, this is John Renan. I guess I have another question. Um, so you're mentioning that the chytrid uh, fungus has appeared in some some isolated sites in the desert where it's really surprising it would be, so forth and so on. Um, how does the chytrid spread, and how could it have ended up out in these isolated areas? And, and is there a clue in there about how to prevent it from spreading across the landscape? That's a really good question. Um, it can one of the biggest spreaders of I think chytrid before we knew um, how we were spreading it was amphibian biologists are people working in wetlands. Um, uh, so my lab has always basically decontaminated every time we've gotten water, had mud, so forth. It needs to be decontaminated um, with, with basically bleach. Um, now, we're aware of it because we study amphibians. But if you have people who are managing the waters, going out to clean out the waters, um, they might not know that when, after they use their nets in the water, that it actually needs to be decontaminated for diseases before they move to the next water. Um, there's also uh, someone was suggesting, although I don't think this has been tested, that um, birds could help spread because the keratin in their feathers is similar to the keratin um, that's impacted by the chytrid fungus on amphibians. Um, but that hasn't been looked at. Um, so there are many ways it could happen. We know people are a big way. Thanks, Carrie. Um, I think we could take one more question if there's any out there. All right, then. Well, thank you very much, Carrie, for the presentation today. Thank and you. I want to thank you all for joining us and be on the lookout for future presentations related to this critical management question as well as others. Thanks, Carrie. Okay. Amy, all this right, one will you. be put up on the LCC website. That's right. Are so this will be um, posted. The Desert LCC has a YouTube channel where we are posting our, our public webinars, and this one will be available there shortly, within a few days. So if you missed part of it or want to share it with anyone or review it, uh, you can find it there just by Googling Desert LCC YouTube. And if for some reason you want some of the links it's in a format you can't get the links off uh, what they've uploaded. Go ahead and email me. Um, I'm at uh, it's Carrie G Carrie Griffiths Dash Kyle at ttu edu. Um, you can find me by googling me, and I'd be happy to send those to you. And Carrie, if you want to just send me the links in an email, I can okay. add them um, to the YouTube um, recording to the okay. to the description. That will work. That would be great. All right. Thanks, folks. Have a great day. All right. Thanks. See you. Thank you. Thank you.